Okay, welcome everyone. So we'll get started. So, uh, what I want to do today is give a bit of an introduction to reinforcement learning, which will be RL from here on in. So last time, I sort of briefly introduced this by talking about uh, the game of Go as an RL problem. And then I explained, or at least claimed, uh, that if you had an optimal value function for Go, then you could play according to that value function and beat everybody. Okay, so that's a consequence of having this function. Moreover, that such a thing exists. That was a claim. Uh, and then the statement was something like, Oh, yes. That's true. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, yes, I should count. I don't even know if it's possible to draw and go or if that ever happens, but right. Yeah. So, technically, I mean something a bit more precise. That's right. But I'll, the, the details of what exactly I mean by optimal will, will come. Uh, and the point was that somehow, okay, maybe that exists, but it might be very hard to actually find it. And that, in particular, that approximation problem might be better performed using uh, not, say, polynomial functions as a sort of dense subset of continuous functions, uh, but instead the class of neural networks uh, being some dense class of continuous functions. All right, so that I won't say anything about today. That comes later. What I want to do today is define what an RL problem is and explain why, uh, I mean, the precise problems that I'll define always have an optimal value function. Okay. <coughs> so I'll, uh, I'll out Susan and, and Howard and others here who know much more about RL than me. So uh, you're responsible if I make mistakes. That's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't point them out, that is. Okay. So. So the setup um, is sort of standard uh, definition. So a finite Markov decision process, which will be MDP, is the following data. <coughs> There's a finite set of states, a finite set of actions. And of course, this is not the most general possible definition you could uh, make. A finite set of actions for each uh, S and S, a finite subset of allowed actions starting in state S. It's possible, actually, I don't even need to talk about this. Uh, anyway. A reward function. So that assigns two states some uh, real number. What else? Okay, and for every pair consisting of a state and an action. Uh, so the idea is that the environment may not be deterministic. So you're in a state, you take an action, uh, the environment transitions to some new state, but maybe only stochastically. So for every pair S and A, a probability distribution uh, right like this over states. Okay, so that's it. So 
In the example of Go, the set of states would be the legal states of the game. In a given state, you've got some number of legal actions. Uh, you make your move, and then your opponent does something. Your opponent is the environment, uh, and your opponent, I mean, say you're playing a version of yourself. Now, the, uh, the way we'll set it up, a player doesn't play according to a deterministic policy. So in any given state, you have some probability of acting in any given way. So each time you play even your own if you, if you are a policy, that is a choice of actions for every state, you play yourself, each time it might be different. Right? So that's a stochastic evolution of the environment, being the other player, and that's represented by this. Maybe it's known, most likely it's not known, what that transition uh, probability is. But we're assuming it's given for the sake of the mathematics. Uh, okay, so that's allowed actions. The reward in that case would be so in Go, there's an initial state, um, which is just the empty board. <coughs> and there's some states which are, you're finished. Okay, and the reward would be, uh, yeah, so this is not a talk specifically about Go, so I actually haven't brushed up on my knowledge of Go, so presumably you can draw in Go, in which case I guess the reward in that configuration would be zero for both players. Uh, but if you won, you'd get a plus one, and if you lost, you'd get a minus one. But the reward would be zero for all states except for those which are terminal states in, in that case. Okay. This is invisible down there. Okay, so this is the standard picture, uh, which I'll draw because I need some notation for the time indices for the various things that are happening. So the idea is that the thing taking the actions is called an agent. Uh, the thing delivering the rewards and which is transitioning is the environment. So at each time step, the agent receives so at time step t, the agent receives some reward. That's a real number, could be negative. And it gets an observation of the environment, let's say, so it knows the state. And then the agent chooses an action. That causes the environment to transition to a new state, st plus 1, and deliver a new reward, which comes around uh, to the agent. So this dotted line is meant to represent the next time step. Um, there's two different conventions about how to index the rewards, which is very confusing. Um, the way I'm going to do it is the following. So an episode is going to be a sequence. Um, Okay, so that's just going to be zero. Um, S0 should be an initial state. I'll, yeah, I maybe won't write out the precise definition, I'll just say it. So this should be an initial state. This should be a terminal state. The reward, this number here, um, should be equal to the reward function applied to the state that you transition into. Right? So the idea being, so this happens at time step zero, let's say. You get an observation, you take an action, time evolves for one second, and you're in a new state, S1. Is that state good or bad? Well, that's the reward that you get at that time step. Okay, so that's R1. Um, Okay, and the actions should all be legal, right? So AI should be an allowed action to take in state I. Okay, so that's an episode. Uh, all right, so I want to define policy and uh, 
uh, when a policy is optimal. That requires discussing discounted rewards. Right, so. so the discounted reward of a sequence of states Find a typo, Thomas? No, also someone else. Uh, with discount factor gamma, so gamma is between zero and one. Okay, so you start in some state as zero, you get that reward, then in the next, so you're imagining the sequence as being the result of a sequence of actions like this. So you get the reward for the first state, then you get the reward for the second state, but discounted by a factor gamma and so on, up until the end of your sequence. Probability of an episode, uh, I should define the policy first. So a policy is a behavior, so it's an assignment to every state uh, ahead of time, if you like, of an action that is legal in that state. So my notation for, so if I write delta x, this is the probability simplex, so this is uh, the set of delta x is the set of all probability distributions uh, over x with the subspace topology. Right? So policy is an assignment not of actions to states, but of distributions over actions. So a policy is a function pi uh, which satisfies this constraint that everything is legal. Technically speaking, if I plug a state into pi, I get a distribution, which I'm thinking of as a function defined on a. So pi s a is some real number. Usually one writes this as pi of a. Uh, no, one doesn't usually write that. Uh, so that's the probability according to this policy of taking the action a, given that the state is s. All right, so that's a policy. Yeah. Yep. Are you assuming that the game is such that every time you start the game, <laughs> you're in the same state? Yeah, there's, there's many variations on these definitions. So this is what you could, I guess, might be called episodic RL. Right, so you're assuming that you play until the end, then you start again. You could also consider sort of a continuing version where there's no terminal states and there's just one long sort of episode. Mm. Yeah. Uh, at least when everything's finite and in this sort of setup, it doesn't seem to me there's a big difference. But yeah, so I guess I'm asking: Are you assuming that there's a single initial state, and is there a being loss? Oh, I see. Uh, no, I mean, if this was a subset of initial states, then I would just replace what I'm about to say by the average over the initial states. If I was looking at that. at least with go right, there's two where you can get start or your opponent can start. Yeah, but really, whoever plays first is the agent. 
Right. Yeah. Uh, but I suppose that's true. If you're responding, then you have to... Yeah, that's... No, no. I take that back. Right. Because the other policy has as their starting point a board that already has one stone yeah. on it. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So even in Go, we probably want to allow... Right. Uh, well, at least boards with one stone on it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Is there any context where it makes sense for the discount factor to depend on where you are in the sequence in a different way? Uh huh. Not just be a power, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's a fun question. Uh, I, mean, I think that would it seems like it makes sense it breaks the arguments I'm going to give but, okay. uh, well no I mean as long as the supremum of all the values of gamma you're going to use is less than one everything will work okay. yeah but I mean mathematically this is mainly used as a convergence tool right from that perspective one could do it, but yeah. Well, I'll get to this a bit later, but I think, yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's typically thought of as just kind of a technical thing that makes it converge, but I think that's kind of wrong. I mean, it's, it corresponds to locality, basically, right? It's the, as we'll see when we expand the optimal value function, if you, <coughs> if you didn't have a discount factor, parts of state space arbitrarily remote in terms of the probability and the number of steps it would take to get there. Even, even minuscule rewards in infinitely distant states would affect every other state. So that would be clearly intractable. So, so I think gamma is, without gamma, it's not really a clearly mathematically defined problem. It's, there's no reason you'd be able to understand dynamics where everywhere can interact with everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. and other questions? Okay, so, well, S is just a set. But delta A has a topology, so this set of functions has a natural topology. And I, I sort of want to emphasize that a bit. That's a bit uh, maybe idi idiosyncratic. But. So we're going to derive the existence of optimal value functions from kind of the extreme value theorem and so on, just using compactness of these spaces. OK, so we've got policies. Uh, Right, so let P, I'll write it like this. But okay, so by this, I just mean continuous functions from S to delta A. S has the discrete topology, so that's just any function from S to delta A. So I give this the compact open topology, if you like, or it's just the product topology, and this is a product of copies of S, uh, copies of delta A indexed by S. That's a finite product. Uh, so that's a topological space, and P is a subspace. It's not the whole thing because of this constraint. Right? So this constraint is a closed thing. So this is a closed subspace of this. Uh, so note, that's a finite well, actually, it doesn't matter whether it's finite or not. That's a product of compact spaces, therefore compact. So P as a closed subset is also compact. Well, why do we care? Well, that means that if I define any continuous real-valued function on P, let's say assigning to a policy how good it is, that there will be a maximizing policy for that real valued function. Right? So that's how we're going to prove the existence of optimal value functions. So what real valued quantity is that? Uh, OK, first maybe I should, I mean, the metric. Um, So I can choose, there's a few different metrics I could put, but uh, the metric I'm going to use on P, which induces this topology, is just the sub metric. So that is given two policies, 
pi and pi prime. The distance between them is going to be uh, the supremum over all S and S of the supremum over all valid actions of the difference of the two probabilities. Actually, it's probably more natural to use like the cross entropy or something here, but that's not a metric, so I don't actually know maybe what the more natural probabilistic metric to take here is. Somebody can tell me later, maybe. Anyway, this works. Okay, so that's the metric on the space of policies. Um, so I want to define a measure of how good a policy is, and that will be uh, related to this discounted reward. Okay, so given an episode, which is the sequence RI, SI, AI, and a policy, Well, now we can assign a probability to this sequence, right? Because, I mean, who cares about the rewards? They're irrelevant for figuring out how likely it is this episode happened. We just need to know in each state how likely was it that that action was taken according to pi. And given that that action was taken, how probable was it that the environment actually transitioned to SI plus 1? Right? So that's P of E given pi, let's say. And I'll probably get the bounds of these indices wrong, but uh, so pi ai given si p si plus one given si. Zero and minus one. Okay. Then, so the so given that we know how likely each episode was to occur under the policy pi, I can assign an expected value to the discounted reward of sequences of states generated by running the policy starting in my initial state. Yeah, to come back to your question, so in this next step, if I was to have multiple initial states, I would average. Okay, so. The bottom right would be i equals zero to n, because s n plus one is defined, right? This episode. And s zero also isn't defined for the first one. Yes. S zero is fine. So you must take that three Oh, yeah, I should. Yeah, that's right. I didn't say that out loud. Yeah. So in an episode, s zero should be an initial state. Well, the way I'm doing it, there's just one. Uh, yeah, but you seem right with the n. So the expected value of the, so R stands for this, this, this reward. Uh, I'm going to write it like this. Maybe this isn't perfect, but anyway, the expected value of the discounted reward under the policy pi. Is... <coughs> sum over all episodes. So an episode, well the, the way I wrote it before was as a sequence that looks like this, just collate all the R's, all the S's, all the A's. That's a sequence R underline, S underline, A underline. Take the probability under pi of E and times it by this. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, this is meant to be free. Yeah. Yeah, w w bothered by the... It could be an infinite number of episodes. Yeah. Just because there's finitely many states and actions, I mean, you could just keep going around in a circle. Uh, so the reason that actually converges is because of the powers of gamma. I think that's right.
Okay, so that's a real number associated to any policy, and it's a continuous function of pi. <coughs> so obviously, if the reward is what we're trying to maximize, then what we want to do is find a policy that makes that number as large as possible. Ah, yes, good. But the number of states is finite, so R is bounded. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's important. If I allowed an infinite number of states, I'd have to assume in addition that the reward was a bounded function. Okay, so you can check, uh, so using this metric on the space of policies, that sending a policy pi to the expected discounted reward uh, is a continuous function of the policy. Uh, I mean, pi appears only through this, so maybe just expand that out and think about it. Uh, okay, so that means that there's an optimal policy. following sense. Pi star i.e. a policy such that for all rho in P E R pi star is greater than or equal to that. I mean, this isn't the same as the claim I made earlier about the existence of an optimal value function. That's a separate but related statement. Um, so we'll get to that in a minute, but I've already sketched why that's true. Uh, so P is compact. All right. Okay, so the extreme value theorem would say that there exists, therefore, some point in P such that the continuous function evaluated at that point is greater than or equal to that continuous function evaluated at any other point, which is exactly what I was asking for. Okay. Sorry. Yep. Aren't we assuming something like that we um, know the policy of the environment? That's true. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So... Well, you could say it like this. Assume that there is some distribution such that the environment follows that distribution. Now, you don't know it. Okay. Then an optimal policy exists. Now, that's a completely different issue from whether you can know it or not. Yeah, but all we're assuming for the moment is the Markov property that given a state, that the next time step is completely determined by that state in the action, at least I mean, the, the distribution is. Yeah. In particular, if the environment follows the same policy that you're following, you're following because that theorem does not apply. Because suppose, suppose the environment is the the public open and he's playing the same strategy as you are, mm -hmm. then there's kind of some kind of a loop, and this lemma does not apply, right? Uh, that's no. I mean, so. Okay, so suppose we have a policy pi, and the, as you say, so the environment, we're playing Go, let's say, the environment follows exactly the same policy. But they're not playing the exact same sequence as we're playing, right? So I don't see why. And all I'm saying is that in this lemma, you're assuming fixed once and for all, independent of oh. the, policy, the policy of the environment. Yeah, okay, that's true. That's true. Uh, yeah, all right. So for a fixed environment, relative to a fixed environment, an optimal policy exists, right? Uh, but yeah, that's exactly the point, is that we want to sort of lever up the environment at the same time as we... Okay, so this doesn't say that actually the, I mean, the method by which they actually trained AlphaGo was to start with random policies, increase, increase a policy, get it to play itself, 
that's the environment, then it changes, and then you train against that. So it's rather a sequence of these sorts of creations of optimal policies. Yeah, so I don't, I don't, haven't thought about it. I don't know a theorem which would say that process converges. Right, in fact, precisely, I think you, you can very well imagine there are cycles in which you know, you play strategy A, which is really good, and then you find strategy B, which is really good at beating strategy A, right. and maybe it cycles through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as far as I understand it, that's actually exactly what happened when they were doing this subsequent work on StarCraft. Yeah, so they have some papers about rocks as a paper situations for populations of agents. Yeah, yeah I don't, um, I'm not sure if they have proofs of s sort of training strategies that avoid that, but yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, so that's an optimal policy. Um, so I wanted to find value functions and optimal value functions. This actually comes back to James's point. So, uh, so S is finite, so this thing exists. And let H be the sort of combination of this with the, I mean, recall, If you just got rewards one forever, you'd end up with a total reward of one on one minus gamma. So this h is the maximum value a value function can have, as we'll see. Well, anyway, starting from a value function which is zero, all the iteration methods we'll use will never produce a value function taking a value outside the range minus h to h, um, as I'll show in a sec. Okay. Okay, so a value function is just a function from the set of states to the real numbers. Again, S has the discrete topology, so I'm writing continuous functions, but that's just all functions. And uh, just with the product topology. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's a reasonable definition, but then that wouldn't be compact, so I don't want to do it. So it's the same to restrict the value functions to lie in this range that I just mentioned. Okay, so give that the compact open topology or the submetric. Uh, so this is a finite product of compact spaces, uh, hence compact. Okay. So here's where it's actually interesting. So we have policies. Oh, I mean, what's the role of a value function? I haven't, I haven't told you what this function is supposed to do and what relationship it has to a policy, but that's what comes now. So I'm going to explain how, given a policy, how to produce a value function. So given a policy. Okay, the point here, maybe to skip ahead, is that there can be many optimal policies that are not the same. Right? But there's only one optimal value function. So somehow the value function sort of has maybe better properties than the policy for s some purposes. So given a policy, uh, consider the function phi pi from V to V. find as follows. So pi takes, phi rather, takes a value function v 
needs to give me a new value function. Its value on a state s is the reward in state s plus the discount factor Okay, so what's the idea here? The idea here is that, well, actually maybe I'll do the example before I explain the proof and just make, so I'll finish the statement, give an example that shows you why this is meaningful. So this is a gamma contraction mapping. Phi, phi pi is, that's the claim. Okay, but let me explain what the relationship between v and pi v, phi pi v is. So the idea is something like, think of the policy, so that's a, that's a behavior, it's kind of like some local interaction rule, and then you can just follow that local interaction rule and see what its consequences are. And applying phi pi v to a value function is incorporating more and more information from more and more transitions of the consequences of following the policy pi. Okay, so example. Well, the constant function zero is a value function. Okay, so let v1 be phi pi of v0, and v2 be phi pi of v1. Okay, so we'll iterate this phi pi twice. So that means v1 of s is phi pi v0 of s. So if I put v0, that is the constant function 0 on the right-hand side, that term's gone, and it's just the reward function. So that's rs. Okay, so if you start with a 0 function and apply phi pi once, you just see the reward function. If you apply it again, so now I need to plug v1 into the right-hand side. So that just means that I get instead of V, R over there. So that's the reward in state S plus gamma Okay, so through that term over there is the expected reward after taking one step, right? You're in state S, there's some probability of taking any given action given the policy pi, and there's some probability you actually make the transition to S prime given that choice of action, and then you pick up some reward, okay? And then you can imagine how this continues, right? So maybe I'll write one more just because it's useful. Okay, so that'll have three terms. This term again, and then so that means, that means this. And then a second term with a, a gamma, which will involve two actions. One from state S and one from state S prime. And then, yeah. So as you apply phi pi more and more times, you're incorporating more and more trajectories, uh, or longer and longer trajectories through state space governed by the policy pi. Okay. Uh, <coughs> all right. 
So claim, that's a contraction mapping. Uh, it's easy to check that that's a contraction. I'll just skip it. Um, so consequence, uh, phi pi has a unique fixed point. Because V, V is a compact metric space, therefore complete. Uh, so the fixed point theorem says that has a unique fixed point. So there's a unique policy, which makes the left and right hand sides agree. And we call this V pi. This is the evaluation of pi. Okay, so that's the unique value function with the property that V of S is equal to the right hand side. If I take a policy and I look at the expected discounted reward of following that policy starting at the initial state, well, what happens if I put V pi S in it? Well, think about, I mean, V pi is V infinity here, right? It's the limit of all of these. So V pi S in it is what I get by putting S in it in this infinite sum with powers of gamma. But that's exactly what you write down if you plug in uh, pi into the formula for this. Okay. So the expected discounted reward of pi is the evaluation of the value function on the initial state. So I want to prove that there exists an optimal value function. I need to define that. So it's by a similar method. Okay, so I'll make maybe one more remark. The function that sends a policy to its evaluation is continuous. I'm not going to use that, but it's kind of neat. Uh, I mean, the point there is, so how does that work? Well, you go from a policy to a contraction mapping, right? So policy goes to, say, a contraction mapping with contraction factor gamma. And then you take that contraction mapping and you take its fixed point. But actually that map is continuous. So taking fixed points, if you have a uniformly convergent sequence of contraction mappings for the same contraction factor, taking the fixed point is actually a continuous map. So uh, even though you, you take the policy, maybe you, you pick some initial point like V0, the constant function 0, then you run this iteration to construct the fixed point, which is what I was doing there. And actually that still in the end is a continuous function of the starting point. All right, so theorem. Uh, it's a bit of a pity I got rid of the fixed point equation for V. I'll just put that back up quickly. So V pi was the solution of this fixed point equation. Z 
Okay, so I can look at that and I can say, well, maybe I'll rearrange it slightly. So I, that only depends on S and A, so I can take that out here. Well, to show that that actually exists. We define it. V pi as this the expectation value, then it's well defined. <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose then I was sort of cheating earlier. Why, why is it cheating? Uh, yeah, fair point. Uh, no, I mean, what I, what I meant by cheating is that maybe the fact that that expression that I wrote down actually converges is not as obvious as I said. I can you don't get the expectation of R pi being a solution to the Velvet equation. It is. You just plug it in there and it satisfies this equation. Literally, you just replace. Hmm. Well, I mean, you can plug it in, but who says the sums make sense? Yeah, yeah. Then maybe conversions Yeah, so I, I mean, that's indeed the arguments that you see in Sutton and Barto and, and so on, but I, th yeah, you may be right, but I, I think, uh, at least I feel more comfortable presenting it as at a fixed point, but maybe, maybe you don't need to use that. Well, uh, I mean, I think if you were to prove directly that that sum converges, you're basically just repeating the proof of the Banach fixed point theorem. I mean, uh, I think it's, I think it's, yeah, I mean, it's probably the same content. Okay, so the Bellman equation is, uh, I don't know if people refer to this also as the Bellman equation, but usually the Bellman equation is where you replace this part over on the right hand side by something that doesn't depend on pi. So that's the following. So I'm going to call this the optimal value function. Uh, that term will be justified by the next statement, I mean the meaning of optimal. Uh, okay, and V star is V pi star for an optimal policy pi. Okay. The fact that there exists a unique solution is just because this operator is it's the same argument. Okay, so phi from V to V given by phi V S is the right hand side here. So that's a contraction mapping. So it has a unique fixed point. So we call that V star. So that's for free. But what we have to argue for is, is this latter point, that that's actually the evaluate, well, 
It's also basically, obviously, the evaluation of some policy. But the fact that that policy is optimal uh, seems to require us to actually do something. So uh, I think this is the same content as what's called the policy improvement theorem. I'm not quite sure about that. But OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a policy. So suppose V star is given. So somehow I've got this value function. Then I can define a policy which in state S just does whatever action the value function thinks is best. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe I should clarify. So pi star is a probability distribution. What I mean is it's got probability one for precisely one action. The action for which it has probability one is that action for which this sum has maximal value. Maybe there's more than one action for which that's true. Just pick one. Okay. So call that policy pi star. Obviously, since you're choosing, maybe there's more than one of them. It doesn't matter. Okay. So that's the policy. Um, it's easy to check. Uh, that, I mean, if you think about the role of the supremum there, it's easy to check that the evaluation, if you look at the, if you look at the contraction mapping for which, these, for which this is a solution, you can check that that is the original V star. So V star is the evaluation of pi star. Okay, so this V star is the evaluation of some policy, and we claim that pi star is optimal. Maybe there's also an easier argument for this, but the fixed point theorem gives us a kind of slick proof as well. So just in general, suppose, suppose I give you a value function which is less than or equal to V star, i.e. for every state the value is less than or equal to the state, the value under V star. And I claim that for any policy, uh, I'm going to say pi, that pi is not meant to be linked to this pi star. This is optimal, so I need to show its expected discounted reward is greater than or equal to that for any other policy. So this pi is some generic policy. Maybe I'll put rho. OK, so I claim that for any policy rho, if you take the contraction mapping associated to rho, apply it to v, you get something that's still less than or equal to v star. Why? Because phi rho v s is by definition this. Uh, v. I mean, that's the definition of phi rho v. Okay. Thanks, yeah. And again. Okay, now look at this term here. That's a function of S and A, right? So let's fix S and think of it as a function of A. So I can replace it by the supremum over all A's of the value of that as a function of A. So supremum, and it's less than or equal to supremum over this of this expression.
Okay, but now this doesn't depend on A at all. And I'm just, that's some number. I could take it out the front and I'm summing up over A some probability distribution over A's. So the row goes away. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's, uh, Okay, but V of S prime is less than or equal to V star of S prime for every S prime. So the supremum there can be replaced by something no smaller, which is the supremum But that's V star. Right, that's V star is a solution of this equation. So that last line is just the definition of V star. So that shows you that phi rho V is less than or equal to V star, as claimed. Uh, and now this is basically done because I can just keep iterating on the left hand side, phi rho, and I'll get to V rho. If you like, that's because evaluation at S is continuous. So if this is true for all S, taking the limit, the left-hand side is also less than or equal to the right-hand side. So applying phi rho many times on the left, I eventually reach the fixed point of that iteration. And I can start. Uh, I should spell out the starting condition. OK, so taking V to begin with uh, H. So remember, h was the bound on my value function. So this guy is less than or equal to any other value function. So in particular, it's less than or equal to v star. And then I can take the limit of powers of phi rho applied to this initial value function. And that will still stay less than v star. But the fixed point theorem says that not only a fixed point exists, but you can find it from any initial point in your space by iterating that contraction mapping. So that is V rho is less than or equal to V star. So that shows you the value function of any policy is less than or equal to this optimal value function. So it now starts to deserve this name. And uh, then it just follows from what I said earlier that E of R rho, which is V rho S in it, is less than or equal to V star S in it, which is equal to the expected value of the reward under the policy pi star. So therefore, pi star is optimal. Okay, so whether you think optimal value function means it's the evaluation of an optimal policy or you think it means this, uh, in either case, V star counts as optimal. And all right, so I'll stop there.